All right, so we're going to start our discussion of energy with um, the introduction of a new term here, which is conservation of energy, uh, which is used in physics in a way that you uh, that you may not be familiar with. But first, we need to introduce ourselves to energy itself, and so we'll do that uh, to start. So we need to come up with some kind of definition or understanding of what energy is. Um, and we all have a kind of rough idea, but it's a really weird and uh, difficult to define concept. One physics definition of energy is it's, it's the capacity to move mass. It doesn't seem to mean very much. It's not, very, <laughs> not particularly helpful to us. Um, but it is helpful that it connects energy to movement. And that's going to be a key idea for us. So we can divide energy um, into two different categories, two different types of energy, but notice that they both have to do with motion. So the first one is kinetic energy, and kinetic energy is found in the movement of mass, so that when I throw this baseball here uh, and it's hurtling through the air, it has energy, and we kind of sense that, right? We can say that, oh, a wave has energy, it's moving through space, a uh, uh, wind has energy, um, that makes sense to us. That's kinetic energy, and when that baseball hits you in the chest, um, you say, okay, that, I can feel uh, some of that energy. So in a, a thrown ball or a moving car, both of those have what are called kinetic energy, the movement, uh, energy of movement. There's a second kind of energy that's a little trickier uh, called potential energy. And how is this tied to mat, to movement? Well, it's tied because it has the potential to create movement. So if I take this big rock here uh, and I climb up here in my <laughs> national park and break all the national park rules and push this big rock off, um, which would require a lot more strength than I probably have, um, by the time that rock gets down here, you know, it starts to fall, it's going to have a ton of, of kinetic energy. It's going to be a lot of mass moving really quickly, a lot more energy than I gave it by just giving it a little shove. Where did that energy come from? It came from, in this case, gravitational potential energy. Um, it has stored energy, even as, as it's just sitting there, it has potential energy. And with some kind of physical change, we can turn that into... Uh, kinetic energy. So when I push that, my potential energy creates movement uh, and is turned into kinetic energy before it lands on the ground and crumbles into a million pieces, ruining a national landmark. So a boulder on a hill has gravitational PE. A AAA battery has chemical potential energy, so it's not quite as easy to visualize as this, but there's ways that we can store energy by separating different molecules. Uh, we can have electromagnetic potential energy. Um, but the one we'll deal with most in 151 is gravitational potential energy. So movement is crucial to energy. It's crucial to that depth. Okay, so then we want to talk about the idea of conservation of energy. And this one isn't a, a phrase that uh, we use a lot in regular um, sort of conversation, or at least not in this way. And so the idea of conservation is me, it means that something, some uh, uh, characteristic can't be destroyed. It can only be changed. And so energy is conserved all the time. This is a law of physics. So no matter what happens, you cannot destroy energy. You can convert it from one form to another, uh, but you can't destroy it. That's what the conservation of energy means. So let's see how that works in practice. So I've got my little blue electric car here, and my electric car has a battery that has some stored um, chemical potential energy in it, uh, and I'm sitting at, you know, that sort of level piece part of the road here. I'm moving along at a moderate velocity. So at this point, I have some chemical potential energy, 
I have some kinetic energy because I'm moving, and I have some gravitational potential energy. As I go down this hill, I'm going to speed up. So I'm moving from a moderate velocity to a high velocity. I'm gaining kinetic potential energy, but I'm losing gravitational potential energy, right? I go from a lot of gravitational energy uh, to very little gravitational energy. Then I try and climb this hill. Well, first I'm going to convert some of that kinetic energy, that high velocity, back to a moderate velocity. So that I convert back into potential energy as I go up the hill. So I lose kinetic energy but gain potential energy. Then if I want to keep up my same velocity or even speed up, I'm going to have to use some of that chemical energy. So I click my batteries on and my batteries rev the engine. I'm using that chemical potential energy um, in order to gain kinetic energy and to gain uh, gravitational energy. And then if I haven't lost any energy along the way, if I haven't had any friction or drag, which of course I would, but in this sort of ideal world here, um, when I get back to here, I'll be back to my initial state. Same potential energy, same kinetic energy. Now what really happens? Well, I lose some of that energy to drag and friction, but it's not being destroyed. It's being converted to thermal energy. It's heating up the air and my tires and the engine and the ground. Okay, so in an ideal world, if I didn't lose any energy to friction and drag, my energy would stay the same from here to there. And that's conservation of energy, that that energy can't be destroyed. All right, so let's talk about that friction and drag that we were just talking about and when when do you have, when can you say the energy of my system, say my electric car, is going to stay the same? Okay. The key here is that we have different kinds of forces. We have some forces that are conservative, and that's, they're, they're going to preserve energy. Uh, a force that can be converted into potential energy is conservative. Okay, so I can store energy with gravitational force. I can store energy with a spring, right? I have to use some of my energy to push the spring down, but then if I let go, that energy is going to return and spring that rock forward. Okay, so spring energy and gravitational energy are conservative forces, and I can do what I did with that little car in that case. When only conservative forces are involved, the initial energy, mechanical energy, which includes kinetic and potential, my mechanical energy initially is going to be the same as my mechanical energy final. Now, I may have less or more kinetic or potential, but the total mechanical energy is going to stay the same from my initial state to my final state. So as we look at this rock dropping, right, so this is a step, the most time one, time two, and time three. Here I've got a bunch of potential energy that drops. It's converted to kinetic energy, and then the spring slows it down, kinetic that, uh, converting that kinetic energy into spring potential energy. So here I've got a bunch of spring energy, and then it springs back up, and now as it's, say, right here, it's going to have some kinetic energy as well as some potential energy. And if I didn't lose any energy at all, that rock is going to stop at the same exact place because it's going to have the same, if once it reaches its peak here and stops, it's going to have the same amount of energy that it did here, and that means it'll have the same amount of potential energy because at that point it doesn't have any spring energy, it doesn't have any kinetic energy. Okay, this is a ideal uh, situation in which we only have conservative forces working. Now, most of the time in the real world, we do not have only conservative forces. We have non-conservative forces, and the ones we're going to deal with are friction and drag um, that can cause the system to lose energy. So don't be confused here. This doesn't mean the energy is being destroyed. 
It's just being converted. We call that being dissipated. Uh, our rock doesn't have that energy anymore, but that energy is still in the air, and it's the wood of the table, and it's the sound waves that are moving out. Like those are non-conservative, uh, or the results of non-conservative forces. And in that case, we can always write that our initial mechanical energy is going to be greater than our final mechanical energy, because we're always going to lose. We can't gain energy from non-conservative forces. We can only lose energy. So here, our rock has a bunch of potential energy. It falls down here, thud, right? Maybe it makes a tiny little bounce, OK? Uh, a lot of that energy has gone into um, creating sound, into deforming this wood table or whatever it is, uh, and into heat. So friction and drag are non-conservative forces. And if those are acting, we can't assume that our initial mechanical energy and final mechanical energy are the same.